Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Beginning Corporation. We are on our 12th episode today, which is crazy. <laughs> um, for those of you joining us for the first time as a recap, uh, well, for one, you should probably go back to episode one where we discuss the whole project. <laughs> but in short, it is an incremental game where players use bots to generate revenue, and they are competing company versus company to see who can generate the most wealth. So, as we left off yesterday, uh, my intention for today is to primarily focus on an import tool uh, using the Excel buffer to read information directly from an Excel file to a complex data structure. And I've intentionally created what is convenient for me, much, much like a user would, but not convenient for the system. Um, and if we have time, we may go ahead and uh, enable CodeCop, uh, that checking routine that will validate some of the different code that we're using. Um, I have specifically have not enabled CodeCop, and translations will be a separate episode. Uh, I specifically have not enabled either of those features as of yet, because I wanted us to march forward uh, with lots of code and then show what happens when we have failed to account for that from the very beginning. And I think we're at a good point now where we have lots of content uh, that the code cop system will check over and watch. Um, and we also have lots of content that the translation system will go, hey, you know, you, you're missing translations for these things. I was also made aware of a potentially useful tool for translations uh, via Twitter yesterday. Um, I'm going to be experimenting with that a little bit uh, hopefully before tomorrow's episode and that may be the, if i am able to do so um then that might be the focus of a whole episode simply because it looks like it will be an incredibly useful tool so uh what are where we had left off if we go back to our master company here well it doesn't terribly matter much our, we're dealing with tables that are data per company false so they uh, contain data regardless of which company we're in, but let's be safe. If we go to that master item list that we're creating that will be the basis of all of the templates for all of the items across all of our player companies, uh, we are going to have consistent item numbers across all of our player companies. Um, obviously, normally, in a real-world scenario, if you have a database with lots of different companies, there is no such guarantee that you will have matching item numbers across all the entities. Uh, I think this will be really fun for us because as we get into season one up and running and maybe have a few players playing along with us, we will be able to do some deeper uh, comparative analytics of who's using which items, uh, what sort of transactional volume, and be able to do some comparative analysis with tools like Power BI and things like that uh, to see what sort of different strategies players are taking. Uh, so uh, as we talked about last time, uh, this will be used as the template for items. Um, for our first class items, it is just going to be a straight buy and sell. We are not going to do anything with those items. Um, and as mentioned very early on, I am not doing anything with unit or measures. We are doing straight <laughs> whole number, uh, uh, simple each scenario. Uh, we could obviously and typically do have more complex things where we might buy pallets of things and then sell each is. Uh, I feel like with the fact that we are relying on bots to execute our transactions, uh, there are too many potential points of failure with roundings and things. So we're not going to do that uh, as part of this game design. So. Uh, for the more complex items uh, that are going to be done at the assembly level and the manufacturer levels, those items are going to have to have their components that will be driven, uh, that will drive the assembly bill of materials and the production bill of materials. Um, and from a user perspective, uh, it might make sense to a user to make tables like this. 
uh, in Excel. <laughs> we, we often will get Excel files like this from users, uh, whether it's coming out of an existing system or just they think it's a good way to edit these. Um, so I went ahead and said, okay, well, all of my items are made from these simple six items. So those are going to be my six columns here. And in my 2000 series, these are assembled items, which all of our assembled items are going to be class two. So that way we can kind of keep track of things. And we also are going to make use of item category codes for our tech tree to unlock those different items. So we have what is effectively a row of information. And then separately for that row, we have individual pieces of information. This is too complex for a config package by far, so we are going to absolutely need to do some creative things with that. And then I wanted to go one little crazy bit further. Uh, in the case of manufactured items, I want to also potentially require some of these assembled items. So a user might do something crazy like have uh, the standing desk, uh, which has uh, a built-in fan, might do something crazy like this in their bill of material and say, we are going to have a 2001, a quantity of one, a 2002, a quantity of one, and all that data be in the same single cell, which would just be bonkers. <laughs> um, if, if users do this, uh, I, I would say we need to uh, massage the data before we try to import it. But I think it's a fun experiment for us to fight with uh, on our handling of things. So if we can't do this with a config package, uh, what can we do? Well, we need to read this data in via an Excel file, which to do that, uh, there is a helper system uh, built into Business Central that if you haven't used before, uh, you will love it. Um, it's somewhat easy to work with once you get your head around the core concept of it. There are objects that are XML ports that are designed to read in CSV files and things like that. That will not help us very easily here. Um, I think that we want to process it for the information directly from an Excel file. So since this is a master company function, we are going to create a new uh, report object. This will be a processing only report. So to report, sure. Uh, I think, yeah, this is our official first report of the series. That's exciting. <laughs> Import master items. Okay, import master items. Someone pointed out to me, uh, in or at least pointed out in Twitter, that one of the things that uh, we can do in Visual Studio Code, for example, say I wanted to change this to uh, imp dot master items, uh, that you can multi cursor in Visual Studio Code. Uh, I'm simply holding down Alt and clicking in multiple places. And you can see now I've got two cursors blinking away. Uh, and now I'm typing in both locations. So I am not used to using that functionality, but whew, it, is a, it is a doozy. I will definitely try to use that from now on. Um, and thinking of things like, uh, for example, the metadata <laughs> tags and whatnot will be very helpful. Now, on this report, uh, we have a usage category. Yes, yes, yes. But most importantly, it is a processing only report. Processing only true. This lets the engine know that we do not need to render RDL, um, which is a good thing. So, uh, OK, now on this one, <laughs> what is our data item for this report? Uh, I believe I I'm just looking through my thought process here. Do we actually need a data set? I'm not sure we need a data set. Let's see if how much it screams with that one. Okay, that's fine. Uh, 
because we're dealing with processing only, I think we can skip that entirely. Let's try it out. I haven't spent a lot of time with reports in Business Central yet, so this is an area of which I'm a little fuzzy, but that's okay. Um, so uh, we don't really need to present the user with any real options on the request page here. We just need there to be one. So let's see what happens if we say, you know, we don't even need a group. Can we have a blank content area? Great, fantastic. We also do not need an action to pop up on our request page. We just need a request page because we want to have the user select a file when they're done, uh, when this report pops open. So, uh, yes, we will first of all need a variable that is going to be our Excel buffer. So let's get Excel buffer online. And this, interestingly enough, is a record. So Excel buffer has a, a pretty straightforward layout. Uh, it is primary keyed on the row number and column number. So every single cell that is read in from this file will have its own record in the table. So when we do an for, uh, if we do a repeat loop through this, we are effectively going one cell at a time through the whole individual file. And the power to that becomes that we can do filtering to get specific ranges of things. Uh, and the power is also that we can do gets. So we could say get row column three. Uh, row three, column three, and drop right to it. Uh, it also has a whole host of really useful uh, function calls on it for doing a lot of the legwork for us, uh, including some pretty important ones like importing. So when we're going to close this page, the request page, if the user isn't canceling out of the run of this report, then we are going to try to upload using a function here called upload into stream. Um, this is straightforward enough uh, It uh, in the web client, which is what we obviously are using. <laughs> the tooltips are a little backwards compatible. The Windows client was deprecated a few versions ago, but uh, we are effectively asking the platform itself to provide us with an upload dialog into a uh, stream object. So uh, it takes a variety of little parameters, uh, which are dialog title, we can predefine a folder that we're looking from, we can predefine a filter if we really care, uh, I don't, this is administrative, um, and then we will get back, because you'll notice that there is a var here, uh, we will get back a file name, which we can optionally provide, and we will get back a stream object, but we need to define both of these to be able to pass them in as variables. And we get back a Boolean if the user has actually done the upload. So we're gonna add a couple more objects down here into our variable, where we will say, for example, uh, the in-stream object is an in-stream and uh, let's see, our file name, which is just a straightforward text with no limit on that. And we do our file name and into the in-stream. Okay. So now we have nice wrappers around that. Uh, if for some reason the user does not uh, File name equals blank. If somehow or another they manage to cancel the stream upload, uh, something goes wrong with that, I'd rather cancel out and exit out of this process. So we will go ahead and say exit. And since we're inside of on query close page, we can in fact exit with false and say basically cancel out of that. 
Now, uh, we need to know which sheet in the worksheet that we're reading from. In our example file here, we only have the one sheet name, so I think it will default, but it's always a good idea to put wrappers around the uh, language to this, uh, just in case the user you're working with has subsidiary tables and things like that that they want to read from. So which sheet is a another text, because we're just going to get a name for the sheet. And we can say which sheet. And there is a helper function on this uh, that is select sheet name stream. And you'll notice that a lot of the functions here and there, we're going to see there'll be different uh, versions of it that do name versus stream. Uh, one, uh, the older ones that are not from stream were mostly backwards compatible supporting for like on-premise uh, and not working as stream-based objects. If you were working cloud, I think you have to use stream-based objects. So. Okay, so if there are multiple streams, this will, uh, because of the Excel buffer handling on this, it will present to the user a list of the sheet names to pick from and which one they actually want to work with. Uh, and that is done in a way that we cannot reproduce, so fun. We will happily accept the help. Um, there are a handful of code units and table uh, utilities like this that we do not have access to produce with uh, our non-Microsoft licensing. Uh, they access protected .NET variables and things like that. So yeah, uh, we use helper libraries wherever we can. There are great documentations for some of these helper libraries online, so I strongly recommend checking them out. Um, all right, so now when we run this report, we are going to read in to a stream object our file. We'll pick which file, uh, which worksheet we're reading from. And at that point, we've exited true, so now the report will run. Uh, so we want to, when the report starts to run, we want to read the information in. So Excel buffer. Open book stream. Fun, fun, fun. And this is coming from our stream and which sheet? I believe that's the correct sequence of things. Fantastic. So this uh, configures everything to get ready to roll. And finally, now with all that configured, we tell the utility to go ahead and read that stream in. So, uh, yeah, I think there's some benefit to saying, you know what, let's do a quick uh, pause, make sure everything here is working. Uh, we'll go ahead and use an old school message style debugging to say, uh, there we go that we've got some information. And we'll grab our count. OK. So all this is going to do our first time through is just spit back how many rows are in the Excel buffer, which if we look at this cell-wise, I think it's 40 all told, if I'm saying things correctly. So uh, we should get somewhere in that neighborhood when we run this report. Let's do our first publish of the day. I noticed the last couple of times I forgot to turn on the visual indicators of what shortcuts I'm typing. So uh, since this will be a little shortcut heavy uh, an episode, I figured I'd turn that back on. Apologies for missing that. Hopefully I will remember from here in. OK. So there we are. Now we should have the ability to search up our import master items. Perfect. So what happens now is we get our preview page uh, of the report request. Um, and obviously, it would be bananas to schedule this. I don't think that would work in your favor at all. But if we go ahead and say, OK, this now is calling the upload to stream uh, option. 
And now we are able to choose our file, which I will grab the uh, file path of. Uh, seeing if I could cheat and copy it from somewhere, but no. Okay. That's fine. And so far at the moment, I only have the one stream, so <laughs> it's a short, short list of repos. So we say OK to this. It might yell at us because we do have the Excel file open. Ah, it did not yell. In fact, as soon as it, we, we were done selecting it, it zoomed right along and we got 40 rows of Excel buffer read in. So perfect. We've made it to our first stage where we know that we are able to correctly read in the data. Um, this is set as a temporary table, which is generally speaking a really good idea. Um, if we did not do that, uh, as soon as this report was done running and we went to run it again, we would run into some significant problems as the Excel buffer would then have values still already in it. So uh, whenever possible, I do work with Excel buffer temporary. Um, I think that's generally a smarter thing to do. You can go ahead and not have it be temporary. So if you needed a commit part way, you could do so. Uh, if you're running extremely long import routines uh, that uh, you want to keep that data and then potentially process it in stages afterwards, uh, or you, your processing routine takes a very long time afterwards, there might be some benefit where you would not want to do that. The good news is, is, is that uh, the base product, as far as I know, always uses Excel buffer temporary. So even if you create data as part of an add-on solution, uh, your data living in that table will not cause these temporary calls to fail. Uh, temporary is a completely separate instance uh, from the base table. OK, so that's all cool. We know we're getting the data in. So now do, what do we do with it? Well. First of all, we know that we need to, for each given row, uh, we need to cycle through uh, and pull four values out of it to potentially create or update some items. Um, I'm going to uh, definitely write this routine to do some updating on this. So uh, yeah, if. We're going to do a lot of repeating in this one here. Uh, OK, so we're going to repeat through all the rows. But the thing about our data structure is this first row mm, doesn't really provide any value to us. So we can go ahead and choose to skip that. And all we have to do to skip the first row now when oh, autocomplete helps. Uh, we set range, and actually we want to set filter on row number uh, greater than. Am I doing fine first? Uh, <laughs> people completely validly sassing me in the comments. <laughs> yep, we are definitely doing find set. <laughs> uh, yeah, old, old habits. On the bright side, I did not do the really old school find dash. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, slowly but surely twirling our way into the 21st century. <laughs> you would think the colors would tip me off. Um, OK, so now we are going ahead and skipping the first row because we don't need it. What we can do is we can also do some filtering of our data set within a loop if we're careful about uh, filtering back. And what I mean by that is we can now say within this filter uh, set range on this to column number one as long as we afterwards 
make sure we're not messing ourselves up by clearing the filter uh, before we do our next call. Um, you can change filters left and right. Uh, you can change filters to things that no longer even match what you did things on as long as you don't move. Uh, it, it is the motion that uh, the filters really basically come into effect. And the reason for that is you might want to stack 12 different filters up before you do your very first call for efficiency's sake. So the nice thing here is that we have a little bit of freedom to... Uh, do some interesting record motion if we want. And we can even break the rules a little bit here and do motions within this loop. So for example, here we're saying we want only to grab uh, the first column. We uh, want to do a few different things. And I'm, I'm breaking one of my own rules that I should fix. <laughs> I did not lay out what do we want to do inside of this loop. So before we start coding things, let's talk about what that is. We want to uh, create or update an item with the PK for uh, column one and then columns uh, two through four will go ahead and pull in some subsidiary data. Then, after we've done that, we want to create or update the item bill of material based on columns. And unfortunately, when we're dealing with imports via code, we have to be a little less flexible. We have to define this is the format. So if we decide later on there is another uh, fifth column that we want to have attached to this item number, the way we're going to write it today, we would need to update the import routine to process this information. Um, we absolutely, as developers, as we get through things, could do all sorts of brilliant stuff. Like, for example, we could say, you know, uh, we know fabric is 1001. We could potentially put information up here and make a matrix out of the import routine. Uh, I've seen some extremely elaborate and clever Excel importing routines. We're not going to over-engineer that today. Uh, just not going to do it. <laughs> So uh, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. All right, so columns five through 10 are the bill of material for the simple items. And then we will also create, update the uh, bill of material in column 11, complex items. And finally, we'll create update routing in column 12. Yeah. OK. All right, so that gives us a little bit more uh, of a map of what we're going to do. Uh, one thing that I I'm not sure how I want to handle just yet is if we came back later and decided, you know, we're going to drop this from zero to one, uh, from one to zero. Uh, do we want to do anything with that? Um, because then we're also dealing with deletes, not just creates and updates. So we might might handle a special case there uh, if it goes to the actual value zero instead of blank then we know that a delete needs to happen. Ooh, actually, <laughs> let's go with that. That sounds good. Uh, yeah. All right. So now uh, I find that when we're working with the Excel data, that it is very beneficial to have a utility function that does a little bit of legwork for us. So let's make a quick little uh, get cell value row number integer call number integer and we're doing this very very simple at this point. Uh, we are going to return text 
And we are going to grab a var. Now, okay, so we have an interesting challenge here. We know that we're on a temporary record, we're in a specific place on that temporary record, and when we call this function, we have to move to a different record. But we really need to be back on the record we left behind uh, once the function call is over. And the way that we can do that, we can do it a couple of different ways, but uh, the way we're gonna do it today is our good old friend get position, I believe. Come here. So this is pretty cool. I like this a lot. Um, it allows you to get a string based pr uh, primary key, which then you can pass uh, back to. Um, I'm going to have to open up a case on this. It really should su suggest see also set position. Silly people. Because you can go ahead and set the fields back to the primary key um, and say, I want this one. Um, so if we look here, uh, they give you a nice easy example on this one. Uh, they do it with a complex style called record reference and field reference, um, which is a, a doozy of a thing. Um, but the set position and uh, Ah, I see it's giving us the help for yeah. some very strange uh, linkages in that section of the help document, because we're getting all of the record ref versions, but they are the same on the record version. So unfortunately, all the help files is showing us the record ref. OK, well, anyways, um, we can move to a specific record, like here, this fine last, uh, and then change our position to a different location using the set position functionality. It, and it's an interesting way of hopping around, of, and I use it a lot to kind of park my position. So for example, let's call this starting position. It's just text. Uh, and we are needing to do this because we're dealing with a temporary record and I'm not spinning up a copy of that temporary record uh, for efficiency sake. So, so starting position equals our Excel buffer get position. Hurrah. Now we can go to uh, if Excel buff dot get. And as mentioned, it has a primary key of row and column, so we, nice and simple, can do a f uh, dot get on that value. And I'm going to name our, our return result, uh, which is the little syntax up here. We previously simply had it uh, unnamed, so we, we did exit uh, whatever. It would be whatever it is. So let's do, if uh, we do get that value, then we will set the result to the cell value as text. Uh, if you look at the list on here, uh, we get a bit of information about the cell we're looking at. We can see if it is a formula, what the formula is, if it is bold, italicized, underlined, and then there's additional space for the formula in case it's very long. Uh, but most importantly, the cell value as text. So regardless of what the content is, it's treating it as text when we read it. So. OK, so if we find that cell, let's grab the value on that. And then we will go, we will set the position on this Excel buffer back to that. And because I believe with set position, we, yes, it sets the fields in the primary key but the remaining fields aren't changed. So we get into this really funky little hybrid state. <laughs> now I admit this is a, 
This is a weird way of coding things. I do a lot of work with record references and field references, but effectively, uh, if we say get, you know, 1.2 as our parameter, then our Excel buffer, based on what we've got in here, will be item description is the uh, result set on that. So we have an Excel buffer that the row is 1, the column is 2, and the cell value as text is item description. But if we were at the beginning, our starting position uh, was say for example 2.2, then when we do this set position, very temporarily this Excel buffer, crazily enough, will simply say, if we pop the messages, we would see this, it will say 2.2 .2 item description. It will not have our canvas tent uh, kit. Um, so if we call dot modify here, we would be in a world of hurt. <laughs> but when we do the dot find, it does the motion uh, to find based on the current primary keys. And so dunk, it then says, okay, we're now actually going to go get the rest of the records, uh, the rest of the fields, canvas, temp kit, whatever. And it updates all of the related values and everything. So it's a really weird way to do this, <laughs> which is why I write a utility function so I don't have to think about it. But that allows us to do things up here um, and park some information, go quickly get information. And for ease of readability, let's grab row number as an integer. And that way we can always quickly supply that as a parameter. Row number. Great. Okay. So now uh, we know we still need some other variables. We need our master item, which is the PC, uh, record BCS master item. I've not created the uh, routing table. I said I was going to try to do that off camera and did not do so. <laughs> Busy day. Um, not a big deal. We don't, we're not gonna be making use of routings for a little bit yet, for sure. Okay, so now, uh, if, wait, see, it's still doing the uppercase of the classic uh, AL environment. So if we do a get on Excel buff, whoops, we actually get cell value. Yeah, get cell value on our row number one there and there we go with brackets again doing good <laughs> all right so if we Too many parentheses. I think autocomplete was helping me out there. <laughs> um, yeah. Every once in a while, I will start to type things like masterbomb.get, hit tab, and forget that the tab makes the parentheses happen, and then boop, and suddenly I'm off into La La Land, and I am about eight parentheses deep and into a Technicolor Wonderland. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> we had a uh, we had a fun family moment not too long ago. We were watching a, a separate little YouTube video uh, that was a delightful computer basics class, and he was talking about the dangers of uh, doing a bulk update in a SQL call, and he did something along the lines of set uh, you know, uh, content. Uh, yeah, back to 
fix. <laughs> Set content to equal to replace. Uh, I'm just mangling SQL, but but he did something along those lines, and I instantly saw like the different quotes. I went, oh no, <laughs> which jumped ahead of the story a little bit. But yeah, punctuation ooh, can can leave you in a messy sort of way. All right, so on our current row, if we can get a master item. Uh, <laughs> and I'm, I might link that in my uh, YouTube description because the, the video is a hilarious little moment of uh, the series of tragedy errors that lead up to the oh no second. <laughs> the, where the only thing you can do is go, oh no. All right, uh, so we're getting the master item. If we don't find this master item, then we know we need to create it. With one small little exception here, I did write this in such a way that if we get that value, we return that value. If we don't get that value, we return blank. So here, when we say we found that item, we can just update it. Here in this else, we might not, uh, not only did we not get the item, but in fact, that item number might not really exist. We might be dealing with a blank string. So we could absolutely code around that. We could do, you know, another cell value check. Me, I'm not a big fan of doing repeat function calls if we can help it, because we are also doing two um, record motions. Wherever possible, don't repeat record motions. So that means that even though we're adding to our variable list, we really should be, uh, which master item? We really should be creating some sort of variable. And we'll pull this out. Which master item? Now, I also uh, have this little which master item set to code 20, just like our destination table. But get cell value is reading cell value as text. Notice that this is a text 250. This means that if I'm not really thinking about it, and I as a dingbat, just, you know, maybe, for example, I'm just not paying attention, I think I'm over here, and I put in something a little longer than 20, and I just miss it because there's 11,000 lines or something like that, uh, it will happily truncate this text, uh, or it'll throw an error message at the user that is completely unclear about uh, that we're over, uh, overrunning the buffer on that size. So it is in our best interest to tidy up at this moment in time, which master item equals copy string, the result of our function call, from position one to the maximum string length of which master item. Now, this has some mixed benefits. Uh, we won't throw an error at the user, but <laughs> we will look for something a little without throwing in any error message. So there's a mixed bag of, do we want to do it that way? I'm going to. Uh, just as a tidy case, but anytime you're bringing data in from users, think really hard about sanitizing. Um, for example, someone in their brilliant world could go ahead and copy a whole bunch of text, and unthinkingly, maybe this lengthwise looks fine, but Excel happily takes that line feed character, and suddenly you're importing line feed characters into your data. <laughs> AL will let you do that, and boy, does it start to throw off some of your searches. So uh, be very careful to think about how you bring in data. Uh, 
again, there's a, <laughs> there's usually a joke for that. Uh, I had to teach my 12-year-old son recently about the XKCD comic about little Bobby Tables. So, <laughs> um, but uh, we are going to just go ahead and truncate this data. That's fine. Uh, so we will grab that uh, value and uh, we will create the item if it does not exist. So. <laughs> yeah, folks in comments uh, on the Twitch stream sharing some of their horror stories. There is a whole host of ASCII characters that are unprintable and invisible, and you will not see them, uh, that any number of these could potentially be pasted into your uh, perfectly logical code or imported, hidden tabs, hidden line feeds. Uh, <laughs> Uh, almost always a good idea to wash the data, so to speak, and tidy it up. I'm not putting extensive effort into this uh, in this stream, but it's something to think about. Whew, man, uh, <laughs> I think my favorites still are things like where users will import item numbers that will be things like uh, seven and seven. Things, item numbers like this, which uh, contain a whole variety of special characters for filtering. So if you import something like this, may may your system administrator have mercy on you. All right, um, moving on, uh, and we'll go ahead and anything that's in these values uh, for columns two, three, and four, we will try to. Uh, validate those into the related fields. I'm just to move things along because we've been already chugging, chugging along for 45 minutes and we're barely into this loop here. Um, I am not going to do my copy string wrapper around that right now just because I want to speed this up. Uh, so uh, master item dot description and here I will do oy, validate the description from get cell value. If I do something that makes it blank, power to me. Row number two. And for some reason, the autocomplete didn't really want to pop up my uh, function there. That's fine. So um, we will do item category code. The opening quotes really kind of does prompt the IntelliSense to know that you're talking about a field on that table. Uh, and that's what's going on with the uh, IntelliSense there. And as always, when you copy and paste code, watch carefully what you're doing with it. And now, once again, we've written a bunch of data, but we haven't actually called a modify. So, modify. And I'm going to call true on this modify. Later, we are going to need to add some hooks to the master item table to potentially update player database, uh, player companies, actual items. So that's something for us to think about. And for our master item, uh, I am going to, just to speed us along again, validate a uh, number. Uh, that's right, I called it code. Uh, so that's a bit of a shame on me. The item field, uh, the item table uses number as its primary key, and I'm calling master item dot code. Well, uh, and in this case, we've already got the uh, row one, uh, row cell one here uh, in this. So. Um, we have lots of other fields that we will need to populate when we go from a master item to a regular item, uh, units of measure and those sort of things. We don't have to worry about that here. That's part of the point of that table. Okay, uh, so now let's try to do some real quick, simple uh, code on this. Uh, we've got all of these individual parts. Uh, 
and even now I'm doing that here. Uh, so we can do some simple checking on these values uh, for a little loop and see if there's anything uh, set to it, anything at all. If it's not a blank string, then we need some action to happen. If it's zero, we'll delete it off the record. If it uh, is already in there, we'll update it. And if it's not in there, we'll add it. Um, and we'll see if we can get to this today. We might not be able to. Okay, uh, so zooming along here, we've got our master items. All right, so now we already know which master item is involved, but we need to do our own little loop. And it is acceptable in small loop cases to use variable names that are just the I type things that is considered allowed. So, uh, I believe there's a nice little snippet for that. Oh. Hmm. There we go. Uh, most of the AL snippets are T uh, something or other. Just a handy way to bring them up. Uh, so we can say for columns five through 10, do the following. Uh, okay. Uh, so we are going to, uh, we're still inside of our loop, so we can get the cell value at the row and then at i to say we want each of the potential values. And I want to read that into a technically a decimal, I believe is what we made the uh, quantity. Yep, decimal. So let's uh, quantity to update decimal. Now, uh, if you haven't worked with uh, CAL very much, we can't just cast that text to the decimal. We have to explicitly cast that into there is not implicit type casting. So that's a good thing. <laughs> uh, so we can take this text value and try to smoosh it into the quantity to update. Uh, this evaluate will handle um, checking that over. Uh, theoretically, I believe it also is region aware. So if we, for example, did something crazy like 2.57 here in Sweden, it's comma. In other places, it would be dot. I believe it's region aware and will evaluate accordingly, um, at least for the most part, I believe so. Uh, if there is anything wrong with there, like for example, there is just junk data, it will throw an error at the user and I'm okay with letting it throw an error for now. We can, uh, if not, evaluate then and throw our own error message and give the user a little more info. We would be able to pop an error message specifically to say which row the problem is on, even down to which column, given the way we've coded this. Um, absolutely in production, you should do that. <laughs> um, the way this will pop an error message right now is it will just say, uh, shoe is not a valid decimal. And, you know, now the person uh, trying to solve this problem has to find where in their potentially thousands of lines of Excel file is that invalid decimal. Uh, and if it's just a decimal place issue or one of those charming invisible character issues, uh, that is a nightmare for them. So for production, almost always you want to do your own if evaluate handling. Okay, uh, so yep, uh, nice and simple here. Now we can do, I'm going to do a case of, um, because we have created the structure here to say, these are the six possible values running across our uh, columns. So um, we can, say if it's five, we know it's fabric. And the same for six, seven, eight, nine, etc. So 
let's go ahead and create bomb item as a code 20. Wait, I can type. I find it interesting that it's reading my bracket typing as a control alt. That's sort of fun. Uh, so in the case of five, our uh, bill of material item is going to be hard coded in here, which is ugly. Um, we honestly should not do that. There should be some settings in here to say fabric equals what item number. Um, ideally, that would be something we would present to the user uh, on, for example, either a main setup table somewhere or in the report request pages, but we are going to do the evil. We are going to hard code. I, I feel wrong just doing it, to be honest with you, <laughs> but I'm trying to hurry. If uh, we want to even remotely test run this with the simple items, we kind of need to hustle along here. We only have a few minutes left in the targeted time. So, uh, yeah. Occasionally it provides some autocompletes here that are not the most helpful thing in the world. Okay. And now we can copy you down, copy you, you and you. There we go. That works for me. So now for this one, we are going to iterate through these. And if now I had said earlier that I'm going to treat blank as nothing and zero as a delete action. Well, if I do this call this way, I have no ability to know if those are uh, blank versus zero. Uh, it will evaluate the blank as a zero. So that's not going to help me a whole lot. Um, so let's see. There's probably a few different ways we could kludge this together, uh, to be fair. Um, <laughs> what way do we want to be evil with today? Uh, no, I am going to create a proper space for that item to come in as, uh, as, according as text, which I believe technically comes after code. There's, when we do the episode turning on code cop, you'll see there is in fact a right order of which you're supposed to create your variables. <laughs> I never quite remember that off the top of my head. All right, so now quantity as text is get set, get cell value. Fantastic. And now we can say if quantity as text does not equal blank, then begin and wrap that all around this. We'll let save do some nice formatting for us here. Uh, okay, so if it does not equal blank, then we are going to then try to master. Again, we're deep into the code, so uh, check if it exists. And if not, ink it. And down here, we will do an else begin blank, so check if it exists, and delete it. All right, so now we can say if our master bomb, ah, we need to, this is not primary keyed on the uh, master bill of material and then parked. It is primary keyed with line numbers. So we need to master bomb dot set range on our uh, item number to which master item. And we need to set range on, I think I need to name these smarter things. And that is 
is this bill of material item. Realistically, I should rename the fields on this bill of materials table to uh, at least indicate which one is components. Uh, I think that will make things clear. If we find, let's do find set. Mm. It is possible, as the code is written right now, that we might have the same item more than once, and that should be wrong. We should prohibit that. So I'm going to add a small to-do in our master bill of material here. Uh, first of all, to-do, rename this. It's a component. And we're going to add a quick little to-do. Validate uniqueness because we want to ensure that there is only one of a given component in this bill of material because we should never have it multiple times. And with that in place, then we will be able to do a find first. Then begin and else begin. That's an interesting point. Uh, Roxacorio pointing out in our Twitch stream here that we probably can do something clever and create a key on this to enforce the uniqueness uh, the same way we do a primary key. Uh, that'll be fun. I will leave that as a to-do because I do want to test that. That would be a neat way to be able to test for a unique value. That'd be cool. I, I will want to try that. Okay, so if the master bill of material is found, then we will update it to be our quantity to update. Um, now we could just do we master bill of material modify true. We could do this. Um, if you've <laughs> hung out long enough or coded long enough, you'll see pretty quickly this is an unnecessary assignment and modify, possibly. And if we start hooking events onto this bill of material where we update all the player company items related to this, what we are not doing for is we are checking if these are different. <laughs> <laughs> so it is a good idea if you are assigning values to only do this sort of call if it's actually necessary. Uh, so let's do that. If quantity does not equal quantity to update, then begin. There we go. Because eventually that modify true may get really expensive. Uh, we don't know what events are going to be hooked onto it later. It could be pretty, pretty extreme. All right, and our master item here. We might have to get a little clever at some point in the very near future. Uh, and I will add a to do onto this auto number if not creating via page. Um, we have the design of this to, as as often is the case, the line number is automatically assigned when we're editing things because the page where we edit these has auto split key turned on. Well, the problem is, is we're going to create some entries right now uh, directly to the table and the table level does not provide any auto split key functionality. So that's a problem for us. <laughs> So I'm adding a small to-do here uh, for follow-up that we need to automatically number this uh, in some fashion or another uh, if the user has not provided a number. So we will need to do that. All right, so the item number is going to be our master item. Nope, which master item? As you can see, the danger of naming things very similar to each other, you can quickly in, quickly get yourself into some hot water. Uh, bomb item and master bomb dot quantity is equal quantity to update. Now, the way I'm going to handle uh, the automatic numbering here is we are simply not 
going to assign a line number. And for, you'll notice I am not resetting this variable. Uh, so it's possible it may have a line number from uh, a previous loop through here. Uh, so the way we're going to handle this is we are going to say line number equals zero. We're going to force that. Um, and then on the table itself, we will create nice and simple a trigger on insert. And this is a simple and common pattern for auto assigning line numbers uh, if things are inserted automatically and we're not using uh, auto increment, we're relying on auto split key. Uh, if we're inserting things by code, we're and we're not manually assigning the line number, then typically that means we're fine with what, uh, just being tacked onto the end. And when you just tack things onto the end using auto split key, it's whatever the last value is plus 10,000. So we're going to mimic that functionality. Uh, item bomb to record. And I know I explained that real quick, but we're going to code that real quick, so it's fine. So if uh, someone doesn't insert on this with insert true, and the line number is equal to blank, then begin. we want to see if item uh, item bomb two set range on the item number to be the same as our current record item number. And if we find a rare case where a find last is our friend, then just fixing my casing there. If we find last, then our line number for our current record being inserted should equal the item bomb to line number plus 10,000. If we don't find a last record, then we will just hard set it to 10,000. This roughly mimics the functionality of auto split key when we just jam things onto the end, but we have the nice option of being able to override it. So can remove this to do. I just to did. <laughs> uh, so by setting line number blank here, we will automatically get that tacked onto the end. And I'm okay with that. That's fine. Uh, now, let's see, back here in our loop here, we're looking through the simple items, and we come in, we say, okay, if uh, there is a value in that cell, we will do things with it. If there isn't a value in that cell, what do we want to do? Now, a small thing here, we do this case checking uh, here to figure out which items based on which column. Uh, and we do that inside of the, there is a value. Oh, aha, uh -huh. I was thinking this through incorrectly. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, if it is blank, we're going to do nothing with it. If it is zero, we are going to delete it. So that's what the strategy was going to be here. Okay, so if it exists, then we aren't going to be doing the delete here. If it's just blank, then we don't care about it. Nothing has to be done with it. So that's a much simpler logic flow here for this is for this if statement. Uh, yep. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. My end pair highlighting thinks this begin goes with this end. I wonder. It is incorrectly detecting the case situation there. So, I think, well, all right. Well, at least the indenting syntax is parsing that correctly. That's fine. All right. So now we know uh, that if we got the quantity as text as zero, 
we will get through here, we will come down here, and if we find it, then if the quantity to update equals zero, delete, else modify. All right, so that makes a little more sense. Quantity to update does not equal zero, then we do this functionality and if the quantity to update is zero and we have found the record then we don't even need any sort of fancy uh, fancy uh, begin end we can simply delete true because now we know the record exists and the quantity to update is zero. Cool. Let's save all this and test drive this because we're already still going a little over and that was without getting into the complex item handling. We. All right. And just for our first test case use, I am going to put 20 fabric on this fan kit just so that way we have something we can delete afterwards and we'll be able to see yes yes all right refresh make sure we're all up to date and import master items let's see what blows up uh -huh. Item category code BCS master table contains value that is not in the related table. And that is absolutely true. I have not created that item category code yet. So, oh. Hmm. Uh, okay, well, that's supposed to be product posting group, so we have something a little off here. Uh, okay. Yes, yep, we have them in the wrong order. <laughs> so, that's a fine example of you can get yourself lost when you're copying and pasting and going quickly and talking while you do it. <laughs> Let's fix that. At least it was obvious. With import routines, it's not always obvious. Keep accidentally hitting notifications. It's not a very, not a very useful workflow for me. Okay. Um, I did swap those around, right? Yes, I did in one place. This is the danger of having repeating code. <laughs> yep. Uh, anytime you copy and paste code, you open yourself up to vulnerable uh, vulnerability of doing fix in one spot and not another. Thankfully, right here, it's very visible. Uh, if we had copied this out and put it into lots of other places, it wouldn't be. So it would behoove uh, us, if we were doing lots of additional fields, uh, to consider the idea of passing this all to a single function call, uh, where we would validate all the individual uh, fields and then come back and just do the modify and insert. Uh, so whenever you can, uh, if you, at the minute you're going to copy and paste a chunk of code, think, uh, no, it's it's time for a function. It's not guaranteed that you will do it every time, but it might be worth it. And if the copy and paste is not in the same object, whew, yeah, it should probably be a function. Okay, now that's another example of we didn't provide us with feedback. <laughs> it probably would be good if we did, but we can come in here and we can see that canvas tent, desk kit, fan kit, and standing desk all came in. 
great. And if we go look at our fan kit here, do we see components? We do not. All right, fantastic. We're doing good. Okay. Uh, all right, so let's see here. We do quantity update, quantity is text. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Yep. And we're doing which master item, which build material item. So the question then becomes what exactly is going on with this loop here? So if the quantity is text does not equal zero, we evaluate that. We didn't get any error on that. We come through our bill of material item and we should not find anything here. So what is our troublemaker? It could be uh, something related to the page design maybe. Uh, let's double check to see that um, the master uh, bill of material table didn't get any values because maybe we primary keyed it wrong. Uh, so when we're dealing with import routines, it's a good idea to go look at the table. Did you do something wacky? Um, in our case, no, we, we've got data in there. Uh, so it is not, uh, it's not bringing this data in. Okay, so uh, okay, so let's see. We definitely have which master item. We're doing our loop from five to ten. Uh, we are coming in here and we are begin ending. Uh, that should be false most of the time, and we are doing an insert of which master item line number blank. Bill of material item. Okay. Mm. Well, when we are stumped, it is time to debug. So, debug. Um, I specifically created the breakpoint in here where if it is not finding the bill of material entry, uh, so if the debugger doesn't trip, that means that it's not even getting to that, and that will tell us something important too. Import master items. And now it's going to uh, look like it freezes, but blinking away in my taskbar it has tripped on this. So we are seeing which master item equals 2,000, and the bill of material items equals 1,000, and the quantity to update is six. Okay, so that's good. This tells me that we are probably dealing with a validation issue because when we looked uh, at this row, we saw that the canvas tent kit imported correctly and we saw three records 631. That means that when we get down here to the next item, it is not uh, hitting that loop correctly. So that's interesting. But it's also telling me that uh, if it's not found, make it. But when we looked at our data, thought there was records. Interesting. Uh -huh. Our... So let's look at our locals here. What's going on? So, okay, we're on row number two, allegedly. Hmm. Yeah, 
we're looping through our i values. And now we're on row number three, and we're looping through our i values as well. And we are getting some information. So for example, three, and then when we go to our next step, we get two. We do, yep. And we are creating what appears to be an item number, line number, master item number, great. So everything seems to be working. Let's remove that breakpoint, let it complete its little process here, and go relook at what's up. Uh, and then we're probably going to call it a day because we're we're going a little over here. That's interesting. We saw for sure that it was trying to create uh, these entries for this item, uh, but something was tripping. So I am unfortunately going to need to call it a wrap for today, but I strongly suspect it will be something blatantly obvious in retrospect. Uh, that's usually the way of it. Uh, so hopefully that'll be something we can wrap up tomorrow. Uh, I am going to try to get to uh, looking at some of the translation engine stuff, and we may come back to this complex items uh, a little later. Uh, we'll see what makes the most sense. Uh, this one is going to be funky because we're going to be proce uh, processing inside of a cell's single value. So that one was always going to be a little weird and take a little bit. Um, but okay, well, uh, hopefully this will be something that uh, we will experience the typical thing that happens to us devs, which is uh, when we uh, put something down and we come back, when we come back we go, oh, well, it's obviously this, and then we'll be all set. So <laughs> we'll see if it ends up being that. Um, and uh, we'll see if we can find our troublemaker tomorrow. Um, I will upload this to GitHub, so you can poke through the code uh, without having to pause a video if you'd like. Uh, I typically do upload all the code to GitHub usually the same day, although occasionally not until the next episode, I admit. Um, but uh, that gets us at least part of the way here. We are seeing that some of the values are coming in correctly, and I am going to probably continue to grow this uh, file uh, between now and then. So thank you for sticking around for the extra little bit of time, and I look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. Thanks for watching, everybody.